Hello, this is Morel Bernard with the continuation of the story, Dracula. And by the way, please subscribe to Studicate UK channel and please share the video. Thank you. The last time what I read was that at Piccadilly Circus, I discharged my cab and walked westward. Beyond the junior constitutional, I came across the house described and was satisfied that this was the next of the lairs arranged by Dracula. Let me now proceed. The house looked as though it had been long untenanted. The windows were encrusted with dust and the shutters were up. All the framework was black with time and from the iron the paint had mostly scaled away. It was evident that up to lately there had been a large notice board in front of the balcony. It had, however, been roughly torn away, the uprights which had supported it still remaining. Behind the rails of the balcony I saw there were some loose boards whose raw edges looked white. I would have given a good deal to have been able to see the notice board intact, as it would, perhaps, have given some clue to the ownership of the house. I remembered my experience of the investigation and purchase of Carfax, and I could not but feel that if I could find the former owner, there might be some means discovered of gaining access to the house. There was, at present, nothing to be learned from the Piccadilly side, and nothing could be done. So I went round to the back to see if anything could be gathered from this quarter. The mews were active, the Piccadilly houses being mostly in occupation. I asked one or two of the grooms and helpers whom I saw around if they could tell me anything about the empty house. One of them said that he heard it had lately been taken, but he couldn't say from whom. He told me, however, that up to very lately there had been a notice board of for sale up, and that perhaps Mitchell, Sons and Candy, the house agents, could tell me something, as he thought he remembered seeing the name of that firm on the board. I did not wish to seem too eager or to let my informant know or guess too much. So thanking him in the usual manner, I strolled away. It was now growing dusk, and the autumn night was closing in, so I did not lose any time. Having learned the address of Mitchell, Sons and Candy from a directory at the Barclay, I was soon at their office in Sackville Street. The gentleman who saw me was particularly suave in manner, but uncommunicative in equal proportion. Having once told me that the Piccadilly house, which throughout our interview we called a, a mansion, was sold, he considered my business as concluded. When I asked who had purchased it, he opened his eyes a thought wider and paused a few seconds before replying. It is sold, sir. Pardon me, I said with equal politeness, but I have a special reason for wishing to know who purchased it. Again he paused longer and raised his eyebrows still more. It is sold, sir, was again his laconic reply. Surely, I said, you do not mind letting me know so much. But I do mind, he answered. The affairs of their clients are absolutely safe in the hands of Mitchell, Sons and Candy. This was manifestly a prig of the first water, and there was no use arguing with him. I thought I had best meet him on his own ground, so I said, Your clients, sir, are happy in having so resolute a guardian of their confidence. I am myself a professional man. Here, I handed him my card. In this instance, I am not prompted by curiosity. I act 
on the part of Lord Goldamin, who wishes to know something of the property which was, he understood, lately for sale. These words put a different complexion on affairs, he said. I would like to oblige you if I could, Mr Harker, and especially would I like to oblige his lordship. We once carried out a small matter of renting some chambers for him when he was the Honourable Arthur Homewood. If you will let me have his lordship's address, I will consult the house on the subject and will, in any case, communicate with his lordship by tonight's post. It will be a pleasure if we can so far deviate from our rules as to give the required information to his lordship. I wanted to secure a friend and not to make an enemy, so I thanked him, gave the address that Dr Seward's then came away. It was now dark and I was tired and hungry. I got a cup of tea at the Aerated Bread Company and came down to Perth Fleet by the next train. I found all the others at home. Mina was looking tired and pale, but she made a gallant effort to be bright and cheerful. It wrung my heart to think that I had had to keep anything from her and so caused her inquietude. Thank God. This will be the last night of her looking on at our conferences and feeling the sting of our not showing our confidence. It took all my courage to hold to the wise resolution of keeping her out of our grim task. She seemed somehow more reconciled, or else the very subject seems to have become repugnant to her. For when any accidental allusion is made, she actually shudders. I'm glad we made our resolution in time, as with such a feeling as this, our growing knowledge would be torture to her. I could not tell the others of the day's discovery till we were alone. So after dinner, followed by a little music to save appearances even amongst ourselves. I took Mina to her room and left her to go to bed. The dear girl was more affectionate with me than ever and clung to me as though she would detain me. But there was much to be talked of and I came away. Thank God the season of telling things has made no difference between us. When I came down again, I found the others all gathered round the fire in the study. In the train, I had written my diary so far and simply read it off to them as the best means of letting them get abreast of my own information. When I had finished, Van Heslin said, This has been a great day's work, friend Jonathan. Doubtless we are on the track of the missing boxes. If we find them all in that house, then our work is near the end. But if there be some missing, we must search until we find them. Then shall we make our final coup and hunt the wretch to his real death. We all sat silent a while, and all at once Mr Morris spoke. Say, How are we going to get into that house? We got into the other, answered Lord Goldamin quickly. But Art, this is different. We broke house at Carfax, but we had night and a walled park to protect us. It will be a mighty different thing to commit burglary in Piccadilly, either by day or night. I confess I don't see how we are going to get in, unless that agency duck can find us a key of some sort. Perhaps we shall know when you get his letter in the morning. Lord Goldamin's brows contracted, and he stood up and walked about the room. 
By and by he stopped and said, turning from one to another of us, Quincy's head is level. This burglary business is getting serious. We got off once all right, but we have now a rare job on hand, unless we can find the Count's key basket. As nothing could tell, well, we done before morning, and as it would be at least advisable to wait till Lord Goldamin should hear from Mitchell's, we decided not to take any active step before breakfast time. For a good while we sat and smoked, discussing the matter in its various lights and bearings. I took the opportunity of bringing this diary right up to the moment. I am very sleepy and shall go to bed. Oh, just a line. Nina sleeps soundly and her breathing is regular. Her forehead is puckered up into little wrinkles as though she thinks even in her sleep. She's still too pale but does not look so haggard as she did this morning. Tomorrow will, I hope, mend all this. She will be herself at home in Exeter. Oh, but I am sleepy. Dr. Seward's Diary, 1st October. I am puzzled afresh about Renfield. His moods are changed so rapidly that I think it difficult to keep touch of him and as they always mean something more than his own well-being they form a more than interesting study. This morning when I went to see him after his repulse of Van Heflin his manner was that of a man commanding destiny. He was in fact commanding destiny subjectively He did not really care for any of the things of mere earth. He was in the clouds and looked down on all the weaknesses and wants of us poor mortals. I thought I would improve the occasion and learn something. So I asked him, What about the flies uh, these times? He smiled on me in quite a superior sort of way such a smile as would have become the face of Malvolia as he answered me. The fly, my dear sir, has one striking feature. Its wings are typical of the aerial powers of the psychic faculties. The ancients did well when they typify the soul as a butterfly. I thought I would push his analogy to its utmost logically so I said quickly oh it is the soul you are after now is it his madness foiled his reason and a puzzled look spread over his face as shaking his head with a decision which I had but seldom seen in him he said oh no oh no I want no souls Life is all I want. Here he brightened up. I am pretty indifferent about it at present. Life is all right. I have all I want. You must get a new patient, doctor, if you wish to study Zufaji. This puzzled me a little, so I drew him on. Then you command life. You are a god, I suppose. He smiled with an ineffably benign superiority. Oh no. Far be it from me to arrogate to myself the attributes of the deity. I am not even concerned in his especially spiritual doings. If I may state my intellectual position, I am, so far as concerned, things purely terrestrial, somewhat in the position which Enoch occupied spiritually. This was a poser to me. I could not at the moment recall Enoch's appositeness 
So I had to ask a simple question, though I felt that by so doing, I was lowering myself in the eyes of the lunatic. And why with Enoch? Because he walked with God. I could not see the analogy, but did not like to admit it, so I harked back to what he had denied. So you don't care about life, and you don't want souls, why not? I put my question quickly and somewhat sternly on purpose to disconcert him. The effort succeeded, for an instant he unconsciously relapsed into his old servile manner, bent low before me, and actually fawned upon me as he replied, I don't want any souls, indeed, indeed I don't. I couldn't use them if I had them. They would be no manner of use to me. I couldn't eat them all. He suddenly stopped, and the old cunning look spread over his face, like a wind sweep on the surface of the water. And doctor, as to life, what is it after all? When you've got all you require, and you know that you will never want, that is all. I have friends Good friends like you, Dr. Seward. This was said with a leer of inexpressibly cunning. I know that I shall never lack the means of life. I think that through the cloudiness of his insanity, he saw some antagonism in me, for he at once fell back on the last refuge of such as he, a dog silence. After a short time, I saw that for the present it was useless to speak to him. He was sulky, and so I came away. Later in the day, he sent for me. Ordinarily, I would not have come without special reason, but just at present, I'm so interested in him that I would gladly make an effort. Besides, I'm glad to have anything to help to pass the time. Harker is out, following up clues, and so are Lord Goldamin and Quincy. Van Heslin sits in my study, poring over the record prepared by the Harkers. He seems to think that by accurate knowledge of all details, he will delight upon some clue. He does not wish to be disturbed in the work without cause. I would have taken him with me to see the patient, only I thought that after his last repulse, he might not care to go again. There was also another reason. Renfield might not speak so freely before a third person as when he and I were alone. I found him sitting out in the middle of the floor on his stool, a pose which is generally indicative of some mental energy on his part. When I came in, he said at once, as though the question had been waiting on his lips, What about souls? It was evident then that my surmise had been correct. Unconscious cerebration was doing its work, even with the lunatic. I determined to have the matter out. What about them yourself? I asked. He did not reply for a moment, but looked all round him and up and down, as though he expected to find some inspiration for an answer. I don't want any souls, he said in a feeble, apologetic way. The matter seemed preying on his mind, and so I determined to use it, to be cruel, only to be kind. So I said, you like life, and you want life. Oh yes, but that is all right. You needn't worry about that. But I asked, how are we to get the life without getting the soul also? 
This seemed a puzzling, so I followed it up. A nice time you'll have some time when you're flying out there with the souls of thousands of flies and spiders and birds and cats buzzing and twittering and meowing all around you. You've got their lives, you know, and you must put up with their souls. Something seemed to affect his imagination, for he put his fingers to his ears and shut his eyes, screwing them up tightly, just as a small boy does when his face is being soaked. There was something pathetic in it that touched me. It also gave me a lesson, for it seemed that before me was a child. Only a child. Though the features were worn and the stubble on the jaws was white, it was evident that he was undergoing some process of mental disturbance and knowing how his past moods had interpreted things seemingly foreign to himself, I thought I would enter into his mind as well as I could and go with him. The first step was to restore confidence, so I asked him, speaking pretty loud so that he could hear me through his closed ears, Would you like some sugar? to get your flies round again. He seemed to wake up all at once and shook his head. With a laugh, he replied, Not much. Flies are poor things after all. After a pause, he added, But I don't want their souls buzzing round me all the same. Or spiders, I went on. Blow spiders. What's the use of spiders? There isn't anything in them to eat or... He stopped suddenly, as though reminded of a forbidden topic. So, so, I thought to myself, this is the second time he has suddenly stopped at the word drink. What does it mean? Renfield seemed himself aware of having made a lapse, for he hurried on as though to distract my attention from it. I don't take any stock at all in such matters. Rats and mice and such small deer, as Shakespeare has it, chicken feed of the larder, they might be called. I'm past all that sort of nonsense. You might as well ask a man to eat molecules with a pair of chopsticks as to try to interest me about the lesser carnivora when I know of what is before me. I see, I said. You want big things that you can make your teeth meet in. How would you like to breakfast on elephant? What ridiculous nonsense you're talking He was getting too wide awake, so I thought I would press him hard. I wonder, I said reflectively, what's an elephant's soul is like? The effect I desired was obtained, for he at once fell from his high horse and became a child again. I don't want an elephant's soul, or any soul at all, he said. For a few moments he sat despondently. Suddenly he jumped up to his feet with his eyes blazing and all the signs of intense cerebral excitement. To hell with you and your souls, he shouted. Why do you plague me about souls? Haven't I got enough to worry in pain and distract me already without thinking of souls? He looked so hostile that I thought he was in for another homicidal fit. So I blew my whistle. The instant, however, that I did so, he became calm and said apologetically, Forgive me, Doctor. I I I forgot myself. You do not need any help. I am worried in my mind that I am apt to be irritable. If you only knew the problem I have to face and that I'm working out, you would pity and tolerate and pardon me. Pray, do 
Do not put me in a straight waistcoat. I want to think, and I cannot think freely when my body is confined. I am sure you will understand. He had evidently self-control. So when the attendants came, I told them not to mind, and they withdrew. Renfield watched them go. When the door was closed, he said with considerable dignity and sweetness, Dr. Seward, you have been very considerate towards me. Believe me that I am very, very grateful to you. I thought it well to leave him in this mood, and so I came away. There is certainly something to ponder over in this man's state. Several points seem to make what the American interviewer calls a story. If one could only get them in proper order. Here they are. Will not mention drinking. Fears the thought of being burdened with the soul of anything. Has no dread of wanting life in the future. Despises the meaner forms of life altogether, though he dreads being haunted by their souls. Logically, all these points one way. He has assurance of some kind that he will acquire some higher life. He dreads the consequence, the burden of a soul. Then it is a human life he looks to. And the assurance? Questionable. Merciful God, the Count, has been to him. And there is some new scheme of terror afoot. Join me. Join me, Morel. Join me, Study Coach UK channel. Join me for the next video of Dracula. Join me coming soon, the next episode of Dracula. Join me then. See you. Bye.